There's no sound, Robert.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this service of Nativity, the Sunday before Christmas. And despite the renewed measures for restrictions, I hope that you can feel that our spirit has grown stronger and connect more connected over these last few months. And I also hope that you enjoyed that um, wonderful um, offering from Africa. I'll have that um, Sing Noel going on in my head all day. I'll not um, torture Lisa was actually singing it. <laughs> we'll now have our chalice lighting. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith. By its light, may our vision be illumined. By its warmth, may our fellowship be encouraged. And by its flame, may our yearnings for peace, justice, and the life of the spirit be enkindled. And I now invite anyone who has any um, joys or concerns that they'd like to um, mention now. I light my candle for everyone who cannot visit relatives. Very, very sad time for them this Christmas. And for everyone who is in hospital, which I believe uh, the wards in Blackburn are full, um, we hope that something eventually next year we are able to recover from this virus. Amen. And, uh... If I'm unmuted, uh, my candle today is for uh, Glenis, one of our members who's not well. I went to see her yesterday and she wasn't fit to be visited. So we're holding Glenis in, in our hearts at Shirley. And I'd like us to think about the family of Reverend Steve Dick, who died suddenly um, a few days ago, Wednesday, I think it was. Um, we think it was a heart attack, but um, very unexpected and um, thinking of his wife, Jennifer, and his daughter, Esther, and their family, and all the people who are affected. He was very active, Unitarian, internationally, globally, as well as in the UK. Um, he will be much missed. Thank you for all your prayers and we ask God's blessing on all those that we remember today. We will now sing Spirit of Life. stirrings of compassion blow in the wind rise in the sea move in the hand giving life the shape of justice roots hold me close wings set me free spirit of life come to me come to Let us pray. Help us to remember the birth of Jesus, that we may share in the song of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and the worship of the wise men. Close the door of hate and open the door of love all over the world. Let kindness come with every gift and good desires with every great greeting. Deliver us from evil by the blessing which Christ brings and teach us to be merry with clear hearts. 
May the Christmas morning make us happy to be thy children and Christmas evening bring us to our beds with grateful thoughts, forgiving and forgiven. Amen. We now have our first hymn, Good King Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas last looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even brightly shone the moon that night though the frost was cruel when a poor man came in sight gathering winter view the page and stand by me if thou knowest its dwelling yonder peasant who is he where and what is dwelling sire he lives a goodly hence underneath the mountain right against the forest fence by St. Agnes Fountain. Bring me flesh and bring me wine, bring me pine logs hither. Thou and I will see him dine when we bear him thither. Page and monarch, forth they went, forth they went to Together, through the rude wind's wild lament and the bitter weather. In his master's steps he trod, where the snow lay dinted. Heat was in the very sod which the saint had printed. Therefore, Christian men, be sure, wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will now bless the poor, shall yourselves find blessing. Wonderful, Robert. Um, you gave it full voice there. We'll now have a short story, um, which is a video of Plato's story of the cave. What is reality, knowledge, the meaning of life? Big topics you might tackle figuratively explaining existence as a journey down a road or across an ocean, a climb, a war, a book, a thread, a game, a window of opportunity, or an all too short-lived flicker of flame. 2,400 years ago, one of history's most famous thinkers said life is like being chained up in a cave forced to watch shadows flitting across a stone wall. Pretty cheery, right? That's actually what Plato suggested in his Allegory of the Cave, found in Book 7 of The Republic, in which the Greek philosopher envisioned the ideal society by examining concepts like justice, truth, and beauty. In the allegory, a group of prisoners have been confined in a cavern since birth with no knowledge of the outside world. They are chained facing a wall, unable to turn their heads, while a fire behind them gives off a faint light. Occasionally, people pass by the fire carrying figures of animals and other objects that cast shadows on the wall. The prisoners name and classify these illusions, believing they're perceiving actual entities. Suddenly, one prisoner is freed and brought outside for the first time. The sunlight hurts his eyes, and he finds the new environment disorienting. When told that the things around him are real, 
while the shadows were mere reflections, he cannot believe it. The shadows appeared much clearer to him, but gradually his eyes adjust until he can look at reflections in the water, at objects directly, and finally at the sun, whose light is the ultimate source of everything he has seen. The prisoner returns to the cave to share his discovery, but he is no longer used to the darkness and has a hard time seeing the shadows on the wall. The other prisoners think the journey has made him stupid and blind and violently resist any attempts to free them. Plato introduces this passage as an analogy of what it's like to be a philosopher trying to educate the public. Most people are not just comfortable in their ignorance, but hostile to anyone who points it out. In fact, the real-life Socrates was sentenced to death by the Athenian government for disrupting the social order, and his student Plato spends much of the Republic disparaging Athenian democracy while promoting rule by philosopher kings. With the cave parable, Plato may be arguing that the masses are too stubborn and ignorant to govern themselves. But the allegory has captured imaginations for 2,400 years because it can be read in far more ways. Importantly, the allegory is connected to the theory of forms developed in Plato's other dialogues, which holds that, like the shadows on the wall, things in the physical world are flawed reflections of ideal forms, such as roundness or beauty. In this way, the cave leads to many fundamental questions, including the origin of knowledge, the problem of representation, and the nature of reality itself. For theologians, the ideal forms exist in the mind of a creator. For philosophers of language viewing the forms as linguistic concepts, the theory illustrates the problem of grouping concrete things under abstract terms. And others still wonder whether we can really know that the things outside the cave are any more real than the shadows. As we go about our lives, can we be confident in what we think we know? Perhaps one day a glimmer of light may punch a hole in your most basic assumptions. Will you break free to struggle towards the light even if it costs you your friends and family? Or stick with comfortable and familiar illusions? Truth or habit? Light or shadow? Hard choices. But if it's any consolation, you're not alone. There are lots of us down here. We'll now have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we'll now have, may I invite Maureen to um, do our reading. From St. Bernard of Clare O. Let your goodness, Lord, appear to us that we made in your image conform ourselves to it. In our own strength, we cannot in, imitate, imitate your majesty, power and wonder, nor is it fitting for us to try. But your mercy reaches us from the heavens, through the clouds to the earth below. You have come to us as a small child, but you have brought us the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal love. Thank you very much, Maureen. And we'll now have our next hymn, Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room. 
and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Saviour reigns, let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glory of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love let us pray the feast day of your birth resembles you god because it brings joy to all humanity. Old people and infants alike enjoy your day. Your day is celebrated from generation to generation. Kings and emperors may pass away and the festivals to commemorate them soon lapse. But your festival will be remembered until the end of time. Your day is a means and a pledge of peace. At your birth, heaven and earth were reconciled. Since you came from heaven to earth on that day, our sins became forgivable as we forgive others. You gave us so many gifts on the day of your birth, a treasure chest of spiritual medicines for the sick, spiritual light for the blind, the cup of salvation for the thirsty, the bread of life for the hungry. In the winter when trees are bare, you give us spiritual fruit. In the frost when the earth is barren, you bring new hope to our souls and renewed love for each other. Help us to shine forth that love. Amen.
this time of year always makes us a bit contemplative and nostalgic. I remember when I was a child and on Christmas Eve being sent to bed while listening to updates on Santa's travels and a Christmas carol playing on Armed Forces Radio in my bedroom. The morning would bring great anticipation and excitement. My father standing outside my bedroom door, shaving ever so slowly with his electric shaver and telling me to wait until he was finished. It was torture. I could only imagine what was on the other side of that door. The living room transformed into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, a toy store that would have made Hamley's pale in comparison. Oh, and oh yes, a pony. When that door finally opened and I was at last allowed to run to the tree, it was, upon reflection, a truth that was better than any image I could have conjured up. The tree was colorfully lit up, our dog Missy sniffing at a box of biscuits wrapped up just for her, Christmas carols on the radio, and my parents smiling, albeit a bit weary from putting together the red bike that I eventually wore out and showering me with a love that was strong and real. I never did get that pony though. <laughs> Other than a trip down memory lane, what relevance does this have for today? Are there any lessons to be gleaned from a child's desires at Christmas? Can we discern how imagination and desire differ from reality and truth. A coming together of what is wanted on one hand and what is actually possible on the other. Observing a child's Christmas list and a parent's ability to meet that list shows us that compromise and acceptance are a necessary part of growing up. Just because one imagines something won't make it true. Understanding truth requires compromise. However, in today's world, the ability to compromise seems to be lost. Polite discourse and agreeing to disagree is but a shadow of the arguments that now so often take place in the public square and political sphere. So often when we embark on talking about current affairs and relate our opinions, we are unmoved by the opposition and dig our heels in deeper and shout louder because of course, we hold the truth. We are blind to the reasonable edge of opposition. Was this where Jesus was born? A platonic division of human and divine, hope and despair, fantasy and reality. We find ourselves observing political forces launching attacks versus a peaceful existence, justice and truth versus lies, division and polarization versus healing and togetherness. Sometimes we are on the side that has to turn away from inciting divisions and look into the light. This can be plain, painful as Plato's illustration of the cave demonstrates. However, it is critical that we stretch and open our eyes while striving to understand the other, to acknowledge the reasonable edge of opposition. Faith matters. Having a faith calls into question greed, selfishness, wanting to be in complete control and self-righteousness. Jesus's birth in a stable gives credibility to what for many is a simple existence without riches or status. Jesus's life exemplified 
are reaching out to those who were on the margins of society and saying, you matter. Each of you has value beyond measure. Jesus lived on the edge of the opposition and oftentimes launched right into the middle of controversy and personal attacks. Yet, even though we know that all hearts and minds, that not all hearts and minds were changed or even moved, we know some were. We know that some people came to believe that to experience harmony, compromise is necessary. They understood that love means saying, there is truth in what you say, and even having to say sorry sometimes. The birth of Jesus on the edge of society, the edge of opposition, shows us a way through all of the hate and anger that pervades society today. His actions and peaceful striving for justice while loving each and every human being equally brings us from imagining the truth as we want to see it and living in our own reality to clearer sight and a more loving existence. For now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. We'll now have our last hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild cometh with the holy child. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, comes with him in his wings. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the indwelling deity, born to raise upon the earth all who yearn for love's rebirth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. And now our final blessing. We give you praise for the ordinariness of Christmas, that the day comes the same as any other day. We give you praise that there is no sign in the heavens and no bright star, but the light of your presence in the ordinary birth of the child. We give you praise and, un and unobtrusively you are in the center of human affairs, involved in the struggle of life and sharing human experience. We give you praise that out of compassion, you take our, our part and open to us a new way of life. We pray that this day 
you bless us as we journey forth into a new renewed understanding and a new year. Amen. And we now extinguish our chalice. And say together, though we extinguish the light of the candle, our faith burns on, our vision remains bright, our fellowship warm, and our yearnings for peace, justice, and the life of the spirit constant. So be it until we meet again. Thank you for our festive um, postlude. Yep, very good. <laughs>